hello everyone my today's topic is feminism and how feminism relates to the field of literary studies now feminism appears to be a much malignant term and someone like margaret walters for instance in her book feminism a very short introduction devotes the whole chapter to trace the long history of opposition to the term feminism and what is interesting is that this opposition doesn't merely come from people who are opposed to the idea of equality of women but also doesn't merely come from the people like virginia woolf whose works are regarded as central to contemporary feminist theory there is a problem involved in dealing with a theoretical term that is so regularly vilified and the problem is that in such cases we end up with a purely negative theoretical category sort of a blank a perversion a lack which becomes difficult to study in itself so one of the first things that we need to do here i think uh, is to try and fix some sort of uh, uh, positive understanding positive definition of feminism as a theoretical category which can act as the basis of our exploration i think a good definition of feminism is provided by chris wedden as the very beginning of her book titled feminist practice and post structuralist theory in 1987 where wedden writes and i quote feminism is a politics it is a politics directs at changing existing power relations between women and men in society these power relations structure all areas of life the family education and welfare the worlds of work and politics culture and leisure they determine who does what and for whom we are and what we become now this definition is particularly good because by explaining feminism in terms of resistance to patriarchy it reveals feminism in its full scope so just as patriarchy is ubiquitous and just as its structures all areas of life feminist resistance to it is also equally ubiquitous but this very ubiquity of feminism poses a problem if feminism pervades every aspect of our life or can potentially pervade every aspect of our life that is structured by patriarchy then how do we even start studying it how do we find the beginning of feminism how do we trace its history and what social or cultural and political economic context do we locate feminism within since these questions cannot be satisfactorily answered with the help of wedens definition i propose moving on to a narrow definition of the term which we can find in oxford english dictionary in oxford english dictionary after defining feminism as a movement associated with the advocacy of equality of the sexes and the establishment of political social economic rights of the female sex the note then goes on to add section a kind of a footnote which is very important to our purpose 
and this footnote or this annotation reads as follows the issue of rights for women first became prominent during the french and american revolutions in the late 18th century with regard especially to property rights the marriage relationship and the right to vote in britain it was not until the emergence of the suffragette movement in the late 19th century that there was significant political change in second wave of feminism across in the 1960s concerned especially with economic and social discrimination with an emphasis on unity and sisterhood a more diverse third wave is sometimes considered to have horizon in the 1980s and 1990s as a reaction against the perceived lack of focus on class and race issues in earlier moments not this particular definition and the note accompanying it do it lacks the kind of comprehensiveness offered by widon's definition makes up for it in terms of practical usefulness by providing us with some definition special and temporal coordinates from within which we study feminism so according to this definition feminism as it is popularly understand is a cluster of movements for women's rights that can be traced back to the late 18th century these movements played out in the context of the post enlightenment where widen had largely remained confined to western europe and america at least till the 1980s and 1990s since then according to this definition and the note attached to it feminist movements have become more inclusive of race and class and have consequently spilled beyond the bourgeois white women centric discourse no there are of, of course some very obvious problems with this particular definition for instance it may be quite justifiable argued that this definition is too west centric in its orientation and doesn't take into account the long, long history of movement women's rights that took place within other socio cultural contests for example this definition does not allow us to take into account the anti patriarchal activism of individuals like savitri bhai phule for instance begum rukaya or tara bai shinde or pandit ramabai but then this is a gap that haunts not just this definition in particular but in indeed how feminism is popularly understood the mainstream discourse of feminism dis- considers the post enlightenment west to be the major wellspring of feminism and in this lecture series we will use this main mainstream understanding of feminism but at the same time even while working within the particular widen centric definition of feminism we should be definitely conscious about it is limitations which is why i pointed this out to you and in fact if you find interested in feminism i would definitely encourage you to go beyond the confines of post enlightenment western feminism and do a more ex- exhaustive research on the different ways in which women rights has been advocated in different cultures and in different historical periods 
so with these introductory comments about defining feminism let us know move on to the study of some of its major aspects now one of the ways of studying feminism has been by looking at the different waves of feminist movement but since we have been approaching theoretical categories in this by focusing on individuals and their works we will continue with that conventions even here so when we will talk about the waves we will talk about them in our discussion of some figures or the others so in this lecture i will try and introduce feminism to you of course in the more spatial and temporally limited sense of the term through the works of three different intellectuals we will deal with the works of mary wollstone craft then virginia wolf and then we will mo move to simon de beauvoir so let us start with mary wollstone craft today we will be dealing with wollstone craft she was born on 1759 and died in 1797 and she was born in a middle class english family which had fallen on bad days in many ways her upbringing was representative of the upbringing middle class girls and the families of 18th century england so since her family had fallen to poverty not one among the seven wollstone craft siblings virtues and to receive formal education and given the patriarchal norms of the day it is unsurprising unsurpri to note that neither mary nor of her sisters qualified for formal education rather it was her brother edward who was chosen for that privilege and who was deemed to be the most stable for formal education simply because he was a boy now here let me briefly stop and clarify the term patriarchy i have used it again just now i am sure it is a well understand term in general but nevertheless it is always good to have a definition at hand and this is a definition which i borrowed from the same book of chris we don't from which i had quoted a few moments ago the term patriarchal refers to power relations in which women's interests are subordinated to the interests of men now i will not try to elaborate on this definition because it is a, an assertions are lucid enough and are known enough to be understand or clearly so let us move on with wollstone craft though wollstone craft didn't receive any formal education she was taught to read and write and she used that to become a self taught person from quite early on her age in contemporary england the occupations that were available to all gentle women like wollstone craft what severely limited and they can contributed primarily of a either being a governess or a companion to a lady or being a teacher to young children mary wollstone craft tried out most of these professions during her early lifetime but she really came on her own when her publisher friend and patron joseph johnson offered her the role of a contributor in his analytical review one of the chief disappointments of wollstone craft's life was her relationship with american merchant named gilbert with whom she was passionately in love and with whom she had a child named fanny 
outside the wedlock. After her separation with Gilbert, Wollstonecraft married the English journalist and radical laws for William Goldwyn and on August 19, sorry, 1797, she gave birth to a daughter who would be known in history as Mary Shelley, the author of the famous novel Frankenstein. She would, however, die shortly after giving birth to her daughter and this would bring to an end of the most exemplary lives led by a woman in the 18th century, building hard comparatively brief lifespan. Significant amount of her writings which included some fiction but also more importantly socio-political treatise which would question some of the fundamental aspects of her contemporary society. The best known these treatise is a piece titled A Vindication of the Rights of Women, which published in 1792. And this piece is widely regarded as one of the earliest tracts of modern feminism, with its main thrust being on the idea that women should be put forward as rational subjects. Women should be understood as rational subjects. No, we will have to come back to this idea of women as rational subject later on. But before I do that, I would like to briefly dwell on the qualifier earliest that I have used to describe Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women. I said it is one of earliest tracts of modern feminism. Now, if you are looking for these treatise, the role of women in society within the contest of the Western world, then the year 1792, when we saw the publication of Vindication is actually rather a late date and for instance, we already find a full-fledged polemic written in English and discussing the superiority of uh, women over men as early in 1589 and this was the tract that was written by Jane Anger and it was published under the title Protect Protection for Women and it makes this very interesting argument about Eve, the biblical figure Eve better than Adam because he was made not from the dust of the ground as was Adam, but rather she was made from the flesh and bones of Adam. And so she was better and purer than Adam now as is evident from this particular argument mobilized by Jean Anger to elevate the status of women. Such early feminist texts that preceded Wollstonecraft's of vindication, we are all using various interpretations of the Bible to make their point and the Bible in turn provided these early advocates of women's rights or women's superiority within a society with a number of significant women figures whom they could he walked to make their arguments starting from Mary the mother of Jesus to Mary who repented for her sins to Jesus the use of these Christian figures and the Bible to promote the status of women within society is also understandable because these tracts are being returned within the context of a geocentric society where all major social and political arguments are God-driven but this spirit of enlightenment that swept through your during 
the 18th century brought about our paradigm shift divinity was replaced by rationality as the key argument underlying women social and political life and this ideological refreezing of women's position within the show political matrix was most decisively attracted out on the world stage in the form of two revolutions the first was the american revolution uh, that took place between 1765 and 1783 and the second was the french revolution which started as we all know in 1789 with the storming of bastille and then in the 1790s it went on to unseat the bourbon monarchy thanks